الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيبنا ونبينا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد المصطفى صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين الغر الميمين المظلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الأول إلى الآخر إلى يوم الدين Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome once again. Uh, you're watching us live on Imam Hussein TV. This is T3, Teach, Talk and Thrive, inshallah. Um, I am your presenter, Ali Al Burji, for any of you who just uh, joined in. And with us, once again, honored to have Sayyid Shabir Kirmani. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sayyidina, how are you? Alhamdulillah, doing well. Alhamdulillah, good, mashallah. Today, we've had a proper Mediterranean weather or <laughs> Middle Eastern weather. <laughs> and uh, you said as well, you reminded you of Florida. Florida, yeah. Mashallah, <laughs> indeed, today was quite a challenge for any of our brothers or sisters who had to uh, uh, expose themselves for too long in the sun. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, reward you uh, heavily. Um, inshallah, today we'd like to uh, discuss um, chaining yesterday's conversation about wealth and whether it is the best aid, we'd like to continue today, inshallah, with managing your income. Uh, now, before starting, inshallah, I just wanted to inform you that uh, on the second half um, of our show, we'll open the lines for any of you who would like to join in and ask questions. Please do so. I urge you to do so. Uh, the telephone number will be visible on the uh, lower bottom of your screens. Also, WhatsApp number will be available for you to text if you don't want to call. Now, Sayyidina, yesterday we had, mashallah, a very beautiful discussion regarding wealth. And we've established that having wealth is not a bad thing. Or having the urge or the intention of attaining more wealth is not a bad thing, subject to your intention. Meaning that uh, if you want to use it for a positive purpose, like helping your community. As you've mentioned, it's not just about earning for myself, it's about earning to help my neighbors, to help my community, my brothers and sisters, whether it be a community as in um, within the same city or same country, it can be community as in from the other side of the world. Now, what I uh, would like to continue on yesterday's topic is with regards to the wealth. How should we spend it? And inshallah, we'll take it from there. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Very good point that you bring up about how one should spend their income that they make. So we've established in previous episodes that Islam indicates actually that one should have wealth. But we drew a contrast between wealth and materialism. We need to be cautious of materialism, yet we need to work and strive to expand wealth. And wealth is not only financial, there's other forms of wealth, but Financial wealth is also encouraged. Wealth could be intellectual wealth, the knowledge that you have, the, for the wisdom from the Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam. This Asad. is also a form of wealth. Having family, good, strong family ties, this is a wealth. Many people in the world have, have, are not on good terms with their family members. They're not on good terms with, with you know, their, their parents sometimes, God forbid, their siblings, um, cousins. And this is unfortunately a tragedy. It Having is. good relationships with your family is a, is a, is a real blessing. It's a wealth. The same way, the same way with finances, we should look to have that that type of wealth as well, the financial wealth in our lives as well. But the goal is to do what Islam asks us to do with that wealth, and that is to develop our community and our society. There's many people around the world who need this. There's many people even in our own neighborhoods. In America, you know, you have people in your backyard, and I mean by that, in your neighborhoods, who go to sleep hungry every single day. Yeah. There's many Western countries. We think poverty is not in this part of the world. It definitely is. Oh, a hundred percent. At a very high level, you know. The fact that they may try and hide it is a facade. Mm, it's a, it, it is at some level, and we have to. We have a responsibility towards that end. And many people, Alhamdulillah, are working towards fulfilling that responsibility. Mm -hmm. But when we look at I'm content, the question that from previous episode that I'm content with my life. Well, don't just think individually on yourself. The Ahlul Bayt have told us this, the Prophet has told us this. You need to be concerned with the affairs of the Muslim community. And if you're not, فَلَيْسَ Muslim. You're not a Muslim in the true sense of the word. So there are people who are orphans in Iraq. There are families of Shuhada in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, throughout the world. People are suffering tremendously. We have a responsibility to them as well. 
you know, they say charity is local. It's very true. We have responsibility to our immediate vicinity as well. For those viewers who may be in other parts of the world, in Pakistan, in Iraq, they may be in other parts of the world who are watching the show, you have a responsibility if you have that ability and Allah has given you the opportunity, expand your income. Not so that you can live better individually, but so you can help your community thrive as much as possible. True, and as you mentioned, it's not just about charity. Mm. It's also about, um, for example, teaching people in order for them to learn how to acquire their own income. Mm. So you, at the same time, could invest. As you've mentioned in mm. the previous episodes, that the most beautiful thing is rather than just keep giving charity, that people will still be dependent on you, mm. is try and make them independent. And at mm. the same time, like as yourself, you're fully aware, what best thing would be for you to invest in something, let it grow, and then obviously you can extract the fruits of that investment. So you can both benefit the one who's um, gained from mm. your investment, which mm. is a form of charity, and then eventually you both will be benefiting from a profit, for example. Absolutely. And that's and a beautiful way for people to see it, that they could help in other places in the world, like third world countries. Absolutely. And that's how it should be. That we in the West have been blessed with many opportunities. And in, in the sense of material opportunities, yeah. for example, economic opportunities. We have access to some of the best universities in the world. We have access to some of the best hospitals and medical facilities in the world. We have a lot of access to a lot of material good. Now, one, I may stop and say at the same time, there may be things that those in the East are blessed with that we may not have, for example. That's true. For example, proximity to Ahlul Bayt Ali's blessed shrines. We suffer from lack of that proximity. Yes, we can take a flight, we can go there, but actually being there, there's a certain barakah and blessing just being in that vicinity. And so those who are there should not ever neglect this. Those in Karbala have a tremendous thing. blessing. It's a double-edged sword. Anyone who had the experience of living in these holy sites. Unfortunately, um, you may sometimes witness that people who come from abroad mm. respect and appreciate it more. Mm. Because eventually, I don't know, it must be in the human nature that mm. we take things for granted. Mm. So if, if I live in Najaf, for example, the hus and the, uh, and the uh, maqam, the holy shrine of Amir al-Mu'mineen is a walking distance from me. It might be in the beginning uh, uh, I consider a blessing, but then it becomes something granted. It's, it's like, it's so normal that you don't appreciate as someone who's come from abroad. And that's, it's difficult how to keep that level of appreci appreciation. Very quick point and very true point that you've said and we'll return inshallah back. The notion, I remember when I was doing my master's in engineering and I was studying, I had a colleague of mine and we were in a conversation, a very good guy by the way, he's a friend of mine. Uh, we were on a project together and uh, this was in university. And uh, going to the point of understanding and recognizing and realizing the benefit that we're given by uh, Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam. And uh, the guy was, uh, I asked him, where are you from? Because he had come from abroad to study in this program. And uh, he said, uh, from Iran. I was like, oh, Iran, very nice. He said, whereabouts? Uh, he said, uh, Mashhad. So my natural instinct was, you know, just, you know, mashallah, you know, uh, Mashhad, Imam al Radha, what barak? And he's like, no, no, no. I, I, I'm an atheist. He's like, I don't, that has nothing to do with me. And so the point that you alluded to, understanding the proximity and the barakah of the Ahlul Bayt is, is a gift you may be right next to the shrine and may not realize, or you may be thousands of miles away and realize. It depends on the, the light within the heart and uh, the efforts. Inshallah, I don't, I don't rule out anyone. Inshallah, that friend of mine will come back to this way. We shouldn't rule Inshallah. anyone out. Uh, everyone has the opportunity to get down that road. There's no doubt about it. It's all and subject to people being willing. Willingness, Just exactly. Because at the end of the day, if they're not willing to acquire that knowledge, if they're not thirsty for the truth, mm. no matter what you do, they, they'll never come. Absolutely. Back. So it was important to make this point because we're talking about economics, business, wealth, in light of the Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam, because they are our role models and they help us understand how we need to flourish and thrive in this world and in the Akhirah. And so this notion of just sitting at home has been forbidden in Islam and we've, we've already talked about that. Now coming to how to manage one's income, Islam gives insight on this as well. Is it that I should, for example, be so, so tight with my money that I don't give it to anyone. Allah has blessed me with income. Allah has blessed me with a house, with family. I've got all the wealth, but I don't release my hand to help somebody else. 
Or on the flip side, I get to such a point that I, am, I give so much that I, maybe I don't leave anything for my own family at all even. Yeah. Or maybe I give so much to the point in time that I've, I'm just spending, I'm just spending, that I may instill bad habits in others. It's a very important thing. And so the best advice with respect to how one should manage their income is perhaps given by Amir al-Mu'mineen himself, Ali ibn Abi Talib, yes. where he says that in terms of your wealth, be frugal, but not miserly. Subhanallah. Be frugal, but Meaning. not miserly. And be generous, but not extravagant. It's as if Amir al-Mu'mineen has, he has summed up all of financial education in just two lines. And that's how Amir al-Mu'mineen operates. This notion that when you have income, don't be so frugal. Be frugal, but don't be miserly. Hold your money, only spend when you need. For example, you need clothes for work, buy clothes for work. You need to look presentable, you need to look appropriate. Buy a nice shirt, buy a nice, for example, the sisters, buy a nice dress or whatever you need to do. Buy a few of those, but don't do be too extravagant in there. Be frugal. But also don't be, the Imam says, don't be so miserly, don't be so miserly that you're not even willing to buy one sh nice shirt for yourself. And people look at you and they see you at work and they say that, you know, we're working with customers, we're dealing with clients, that this doesn't look appropriate. Don't be so at that level. At the same time, the Imam Ali Musalam says, be generous, but don't be extravagant. This is very important. Sometimes when you have income, and you're giving to someone, you don't want to instill bad habits in that person. What that means is, for example, Alhamdulillah, Allah may have blessed you with wealth. And I say, Brother Ali, I need some help. And you help me out, for example. But I don't want it to get to the point where every single time I am in need of something, I come to you to help. I should first go to my Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the ultimate sustainer. I should first strive and work hard on myself with myself in order to establish a business or work hard to get some income on my own. It's different for me to say, Brother Ali, I have a business plan. This is my goal. Can you give me a loan? This is a contract. Let's sign a contract. And these are the terms and conditions. Once, inshallah, I'm established, I will repay you that money. Or by X, Y, D, Z date, one year, six months, I'll pay you back your money. This is different. Compared to when I'm coming to any issue comes up, I ask, I ask. In Islam... When someone asks you for something, you are not supposed to reject that person. If someone truly asks you, "I'm brother Ali, I'm in need. Can you please help me financially?" You have the income. Especially you're if you're capable of. Especially if you're capable helping. of doing so. Now, on the flip side, look at how balanced Islam is. On the flip side, I should not be asking anyone for anything. Islam is very adamantly against begging, for example. Islam is very adamantly against putting your hands in front of someone without having done work yourself. It's totally balanced. So on once you've sides. made your own effort mm. and then you see that you're stuck and you're, you're not able to yes. come on top, then you can inshallah ask. Then you can. In fact, in fact, I would propose that people should strive to help. Make it to the point where that person does not even need to ask. That's, that's, that, that would be beautiful. You that know, you help someone without him even asking. But question arises mm -hmm. here. If someone is in need of help, so, so it depends, it's a case-by-case case situation, but if I'm not aware that you're in need of a certain help, how am I going to help you in the first place? Very good. To this point, we should have institutions in place. If you're someone who's wealthy or we have some other brothers and sisters who have wealth, ask them to maybe create a fund. And they're not in charge of that fund. Maybe they get one mu'min, one reliable person who has taqwa, piety, to manage that fund. You know when Ahlul Bayt would give people, for example, in the form of charity or people who needed. I remember the tradition of Imam Rada that he would give in such a study and other Ahlul Bayt, the members of Ahlul Bayt they would only give charity or wealth, or for example, but they would give it behind a curtain. To the point that they would say, if someone asked in public, they said, don't ask here. To save the face of that person. To keep the dignity and honor of that person in place. And when they would come, the imam would say, come here. The imam would stay behind the curtain. They would have a curtain. And he would put the hand out behind the curtain. So the person would not see, that the imam would not see his face. When the imam was asked, in why? In order not to put 
um, the person into an awkward position, you right? Exactly. You must uphold the dignity of that person. To the point that when this happens, the Imam said, was asked, why? Why did you do this? You could have just given the money before in front of him, in front of everyone. Mm. He said, he had already put his dignity on the line once by asking. I didn't want to put his dignity on the line the second time by looking him in the face when he asked and when I was giving him. That's the level of giving. That's true generosity. But coming back to this notion of what does Islam say about balancing one's income, of managing your finances, fa man managing your income? Because, let's be honest, in today's world, many people are stretched thin. And I'm not talking about those people who, honestly, they're working hard. And they're able to, and it's difficult for them to make ends meet. And they're having to maybe use some other forms of income in order to sustain themselves. I'm talking about many people in our modern world who have income, but they stretch themselves beyond their means. Either through credit cards or things like this. Putting themselves in debt, basically. Putting themselves in, in, in high amounts of debt in order to live a lifestyle that may not be in their interest. Buying a, a car that's way more expensive than you need, for example, mm -hmm. or buying a house that's not needed, uh, that's too big, for example. Or unnecessary holidays or expensive holidays. Exactly. Ex ex extravagance. Mm. This is what Amir al-Mu'mineen says. Be generous, but don't be extravagant to the point that you're living beyond your means. I remember Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, or sixth Imam alayhi salam, it's attributed to him, that he was, he was measuring dates. He was creating little bags or pouches with dates in them. And he was counting them and weigh, weighing them and putting them aside. A man saw him. He said, Yabna Rasulullah, could you not have asked someone else to do this for you? Couldn't you ask one of your children, one of your sons or one of your workers to do this for you? The Imam was rationing for the month. He was saying that this is, my, this is my food, this is some dates for month, day one, day two, day three, all the way till the end of the month. At that moment in time, the man said, couldn't you have someone else do this? Couldn't you have, for example, your son or your servant do this? Imam Ali Salam looked back at him and he's attributed to have said that no, that there are three ways that someone can achieve and attain righteousness. And in Islam, he says one Tafaqahu fi deen To actually have deep knowledge in religion. To, to, to go at such a level and have a deep level of knowledge in religion. Number one. Number two is to have patience in the face of adversity. To have patience when a calamity befalls you. You've lost a loved one. You've lost a relative. You've lost a friend. You've lost someone close to you. Or you've lost money. Some difficulty has come upon you. And in that state and in that environment, if you have patience, that's the second way of achieving righteousness. And the third, the Imam Ali Musalam is attributed to have said, is that if you manage your income properly, that is a way of achieving righteousness. Proper management of one's income leads you to righteousness. We as Muslims should be very adamant about our income. We, we should not be so easy and loose about our income. This is not what Ahlul Bayt have taught us. The, I am sometimes shocked that these concepts are not discussed or talked about in our, in our, in our lectures or in That's our discussions. True. Maybe, maybe unfortunately because a lot of people focus on uh, providing lectures as to what's more interesting or what sells more, if you know what I mean. Mm. You know? Um, but it's definitely something that, at the end of the day, we need to use this knowledge in order for us to improve. Absolutely. And we have a lot of um, gaps and uh, weaknesses in our communities. And alhamdulillah, there's been improvement, don't get me wrong, there's been improvement. But I do agree with you 100% mm. that uh, these topics need to be um, more... Um, they need to occur more frequently into mm. these lectures. And maybe it would be good for us collectively to just maybe, you know, spread the word, send the message to, you know, communities, Husseiniyas around mm. the world that, listen guys, let's focus on these aspects as well. Not just focus on uh, Masaib, obviously you can't neglect it, but it's very important to improve ourselves socially. It's crucial. But with regards to attaining that balance, how, how could someone um, help himself understand more 
into wh what's the better balance for them. For example, let's say me, I love food, okay? Especially Shah Ramadan now fasting now. But I love food, yeah? And I love experimenting. Now, if, let's say I could afford to go four times a week to a restaurant and eat mm. or buy from outside instead of cooking home. Everyone knows that cooking home is much cheaper than going outside. But I could still afford it. Now, would it be, uh, is that considered extravagant? Um, I don't know if it's subject to each and everyone's opinion, but how can I understand the, uh, where's, the, where's the line, where's the, the balance? Is it for me to ask, can I attain that knowledge? Is it just a, a mantiqi issue a lot of, of logic that, listen, do normal people go and eat uh, four times a week to restaurants? If no, then that might be extravagant. Mm. Others may do. I, I guess it all comes down to, uh, I don't want to say class, but what you can afford as well. Mm. Should I say, okay, let me just go twice. And those extra times I ain't I'm not going to go, I can provide it in charity, for example. What's your opinion? It's a, it's a very interesting question. And I say that because this is one dimension of the equation, or one side of the equation, or one side of the coin. There's another side of the coin. And so with respect to that, and keeping that in mind, when we talk about spending, now, you're right, there, it definitely has to do with each individual person's income. It's different from person to person, that's for sure that um, maybe somebody has more, somebody has less. And in terms of that, there's a few things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how much to give each person. He's absolutely just in that regard. Now, if I'm making less, that doesn't mean that's the income that's written for me. There is, if I work hard, it's very possible I get more. But we'll talk about this another day, another time. Okay. If I'm going to eat out, for example, in Shah Ramadan or otherwise, even eating out can be a, a form of development. Well, you ask how? Well, maybe I have an option of eating at a very high-end fancy restaurant or I have the option of eating at, at a, a restaurant that's owned by a, a brother or sister in faith. And maybe I can choose to go to that restaurant instead and help support their business. Through that process, I'm getting a win-win scenario. I'm eating out, I'm having a good time with my friends and family, mm. and I'm also supporting a business. But at the same time, if I'm just looking to make a, make a you know, just trying to up my own social class and say that I'm eating at the best restaurant in town where that person themselves who runs that business may be doing just fine and they wouldn't miss you if you went to their restaurant or not whereas somebody who in your own community you're helping them get on their own feet that's a one, that could be a wonderful form of development absolutely, there's no doubt about that and we can benefit from that tremendously the, the idea, nothing in this world very few things are black and white there's a lot of grey in our world and we need to begin to see that. But we need to have everything, success starts with a belief. It starts with a belief here in the heart and in the mind. That I must first and foremost believe that this is ach achievable and attainable. You know, I was speaking with some of my friends just the other day. And they are talking about sometimes in our communities in terms of business, our vision seems to be a bit low. It seems to be a bit shallow. I see that... This brother started a restaurant over here. Let me open a restaurant right next to him. I was going to talk to you about that. It's an issue, unfortunately, we have. That everyone's just copycatting each other. You're going to have one street. It's going to have 15 supermarkets, 15 restaurants, sell the same food. And I'm like, okay, guys, you got the same product. Obviously, you ain't going to sell the same. Or you ain't going to sell as much as you wish you sold. You need to have variety. It, try maybe something different. But... It comes down to knowledge as well. Mm. If someone's lacking knowledge, that's, that's what's another important thing as well. Uh, I can't just randomly go and start a business. I don't have a clue how mm. to run a business. So before even thinking of being a businessman, first, obviously, I need to attain that knowledge. Like yourself, for example, you went, you studied, you attained knowledge, experience. You've got an idea that if you want to get to objective A, how to get there. Or if, if that route you chose is not working, you've got a plan B. But if we don't have that knowledge, there's no point in even bothering starting a business because I'll be just wasting our money and our time, correct? Mm. There's, there's a point there as well. There de success in business, success in, in a career in general requires planning. And we need to be mindful of that. If you're going to go to med school or dental school or pharmacy school, you have to have a plan, right? 
You have to have a plan of this is what I'm going to study. This is my do, this is these are my years in study, and this is what I'm going to do. The same way you need a plan in business, and if you plan, inshallah, you will succeed. Inshallah. Okay. With that being said, we're going to pause for a short break. In the meanwhile, stay with us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome back, uh, my beloved brothers and sisters, respective viewers. For any of you who just joined us in, you are watching us live on Imam Hussein TV. Uh, this is our show T3, Teach, Talk, and Thrive, inshallah. Um, prior to pausing, we're discussing about managing income. And inshallah, we're going to continue uh, with uh, Al Sayyid uh, with regards to savings. How can we save? Is it good to save? And with regards to saving, how can we balance that as well with saving and giving at the same time? Bismillah. Another very important question you've asked here because Islam has shed light on this as well. We have a tradition attributed to our eighth Imam where we're talking about, where he's, ta where he's asked about savings. Imam Ali Musalam says, a man who saves, he makes his burden lighter and is able to rest. And how true it is. That when you have something saved over, you have a little bit more ease mentally. That you're not worried as much. We have other traditions that our sixth imam, our fifth and sixth imam, both of them, it is said that they would not spend anything until and unless they had already saved up one year's worth of income. Then they would begin to spend. This is separate from, this is spending on themselves. This is separate from, for example, charity and people who are in need. This is talking about okay. when they were spending on themselves, they would not spend, even to the extent the tradition said, they would not even buy a knot or a rope or something. They would not even buy anything up until the point they had already saved one year's of income. You know, if you look across the world, you notice a cultural divide and a cultural difference. Many people in the West, they live, they don't, they don't have much, especially in America, of a, of a culture of saving. We don't have much of a culture of saving in the West, in America in particular. Uh, people spend and sometimes they live beyond their means, as we mentioned before. If you go to the, some of the Eastern countries, for example, Japan and places like this, people actually save a lot to the extent that many of them save half of their income. And these people also, when it comes to finances, when there's numerous surveys that have been done, statistical surveys that have looked at what are the major causes of stress in people's life. And when you look at the West, time after time again, the number one cause of stress in people's lives is finance, finance, financial mm. reasons. Whereas people in the East, many times, they don't have suffer from the same level of distress because they have a cushion behind them where they're saving. Ahlul Bayt, Ali Musalam, were totally balanced. They said, make sure you save as well. It's very important to keep that in ah, mind. Santum. Just to pause you, I would like to remind uh, viewers that uh, our lines are now open for you to call and join our discussion. Uh, the uh, line, the number is 0203 I repeat, 0203 And inshallah, we should have a WhatsApp uh, number visible on the lower bottom of your screens. If uh, we have any uh, issue with the lower third, just let me know and I'll uh, inform our viewers with regards to the uh, number. My apologies. Not a yeah. So saving is very important. And, and uh, somebody may, might say, you know, I don't know if I have the ability to save. There's a very interesting book that's called uh, The Richest Man in Babylon. This is a book that's uh, over 80 years old now. It's a very old book, but it stood the test of time. Not People sure. still reference it. And it's basically a, a allegorical fiction. It's a story. It's it's telling us a story. Oh, so it's not based on a it, real story. It, it's it's a fiction, but it's giving us very valuable okay. lessons about wealth okay. through a fictitious story. And the story is based in Babylon, as you know. Uh, Babylon has a very rich history, or Baghdad and, and, and the, that area. It was one of the wealthiest places in history uh, during its time and its era at, at one point in time. Anyways. And he talks about how this person became the wealthiest man in Babylon. Anyways, one of the principles within that book is to save a tenth of your income every month or every period. Now one may say, I'm already going through a tough time. 
You know, I already, it's difficult for me to make ends meet. You're telling me to save 10% of my income when I, I probably need to borrow 10% to make ends meet. Now, that's the thing. How are you going to save it if you can't? Now, here's the reality of the matter. Mm. Human beings are very resourceful and they have the ability to be, to be so. I mean, think about many times some of our, our, uh, our parents and how they made it. Sometimes being a first generation income, a first, gen- mm. first generation immigrant to the West. They had a very limited budget sometimes and how all these kids running around. Mm. You know, I don't know if you know, but there's a company called Five Hour Energy. We have it in America. It's a, maybe you have some small energy drinks like this in, uh, in Europe as well. But anyways, the guy who owns is a billionaire. He's, very, he's done very well from himself, an Indian gentleman. And they asked him, you know, what, what, how do we learn management? He said, you want to learn management? Look at a, a mother. They're like, what? He said, look at a mother. He said, a mother has this fixed budget, this fixed income, all these children running around, she has to feed the family, take care of the kids, look after everything, and make sure that she does it within this limited budget, many times. And the point being, that if you can make it, let's say for example, somebody has an income of, I I don't know, $3,000 a month. Let's say they had $3,000 a month, so we'd ask them to take off a certain amount from that. Let's Let's say $300 off of that, for example, right? They're left with 2700 Now, it may be very difficult for them to make it. But despite that, you can still make it. No excuses. Inshallah. Oh, we'll pause that. We have a call on the line. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Just uh, my brothers inside, lower the volume a bit, please. Assalamu Wa alaikum assalam, brother. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this show and this topic is well needed at this age. Um, I have a quick question. Um, how do I manage my income when I have a lot of expenses to do and is there any hadith with the illness to um, say how we could save up our money um, for our future? Um, yeah. Okay, brother. Jazakumullah. Thank you very much for calling and contributing. Inshallah, Sayyid will answer your questions straight away. So, um, pretty much um, what we're uh, building up to is uh, the brother asked, how do I manage my income, especially when I have a lot of expenses? Now, especially um, brothers and sisters who live in parts of the world like London will understand this more than maybe others where living costs aren't as high. As I mentioned earlier, it's, for example, you mentioned about that 10%, that we, we, a lot of us are struggling to just barely make means, uh, meet means end, yeah? How are we exactly going to save when our income is barely enough for us to survive? And you mentioned about um, human beings very, being very resourceful. So inshallah, if you can uh, answer sure. that for us. Absolutely, there's a few things to keep in mind. It's an excellent question by the caller, by the respected viewer. And every scenario is not the same. For some people, saving 10% may be a very difficult task more than anybody else. So in that case, maybe you can't save 10%, maybe save 1%. Maybe reduce the amount. But try to save something. Something. In light of what the Ahlul Bayt said as well. For some people, maybe 5%, whatever that amount is. But try to save something. With respect to expenses, it really depends. Are these needs or are these wants? That's a very important point That's to note. That's beautiful, yeah. That is this something that I really need in my life or is it something that I just want in my life? First, divide them into that. Once you have the needs and the wants corrected, it also depends on how many people you're, you're, you're supporting. How many mouths are you feeding? If somebody is supporting a lot of people, well, they may have expenses. In that environment, they, they must work hard. And I, and I don't want to diminish that at all. That person has a legitimate concern and I want to respect that. But when we get into the wants, you know, I need a car for transportation to get to work. Very important. I understand that. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's an investment. But, when I, but do I necessarily need the nicest car in the world to get to work? Because is, is a car itself an investment? If any of our brothers or sisters have studied economics or finance, they know that a car is actually, a, in, in majority of cases, it's a depreciating asset. Yeah. Meaning as soon as you keeps buy it, its value. it loses its value. It doesn't gain It needs maintenance value. as well, so you need to keep spending on it. As so well. it's very expensive, right? So, mm. But now, if I just need a car to get from point A to point B that's reliable, that's different. 
But if I need this, if I'm buying a car that's $100,000, for example, and as soon as I drive it out the lot, it, off the lot at the dealership, it loses 20% of its value, for example, because it's no longer new, now it's used. That's crazy. And over the first three-year period, it, le- it, loses the, it loses the majority of its value during the first three years to four years of its lifespan. So maybe it's a better idea for me to buy the car for maybe three, four years used and make sure it's in good condition. And it so doesn't have to be a most expensive brand either. And it doesn't necessarily have to be that. Now, okay, putting that into consideration. Now we're talking about someone who can manage his money by not uh, spending extravagantly. What about the uh, person who is not, who's content with, you know, the basic. He's not overspending. He's working hard. But he just can't make it. He's barely making it. Now, at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help us. Of course, we know there's cases like, oh, what about the children of Yemen? Obviously, they're being oppressed. There is a reason for, for, for the lack of rizq for them because it's, it's been hold, withhold away from them. But someone who's working hard, 21st century, both parents have to work. Yeah, We're very fortunate if we live in a family where the mother can stay home and be the sustain of the house, be the pillar of the house, yeah? But um, for, you mentioned about our parents. With all the respect, from my, what I've seen as well, and you, you're very knowledgeable in economics as well, you will understand that things have changed. Mm. They've got a lot harder. Mm. Inflation, this, the way monetary system, the, the society as well, it's, it's not as easy as before. And the chances, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, the way I see it, maybe I'm being a bit negative, but I see that we don't have the same opportunities like we ha- our parents had or our grandparents had. What you, what's your opinion? A few points here. When you say times are changing, I agree with you. This is a very valid point. Times always change. And uh, indeed, our times may be different than our parents' generation. I mean, you look at Silicon Valley in the, in the United States, right? The West Coast, um, San Jose areas like that. It's extremely expensive. That's the most expensive part of America now. You know, you'll believe me when I say that there's, there's families, numerous families in Silicon Valley. Both parents are working full time, yet they cannot afford housing. They're on wait lists for housing for three years. Sounds like London. And perhaps in London as well, the, because the prices have gotten so high, it's exorbitant, it's ridiculous. It's, yeah. And this is also part of why we've developed this series, this show in general, to, to encourage the next generation, looking at the trend in the future. With things getting automated, with so many things becoming automated in the future, the amount of jobs for employees will decline over time. So what are we, we going to do? So this is where the opportunity comes. You need to be more creative in your thinking. You need to have adopt a creative mindset, understand, and also get endeavor in business, and try to use that to your advantage. You know, for example, you go to people go to McDonald's and these restaurants. For example, nowadays you go there and you don't even speak to a person many times. There's a machine there. You order at the machine. You hit some buttons. They've already s- uh, installed these here as well. They've installed these. Eventually, here as well. it'll be uh, 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 humanless. A humanless. Like uh, I think Walmart, Amazon, trying to establish this. So in the next ten years, there's going to be a revolution in the mm. industry, which is sad. Mm. And it's, it's part of. The, to be honest, for me personally, I think it's part of the end times as well. But it will. It's just getting harder and harder and harder. Mm. Now. Uh, you you were saying about um, about people needing to think sometimes outside of the box and mm. uh, emerge in business when the options are, are becoming smaller and smaller. Sh- the list is shorter and shorter. How if if someone wanted to think something different? Um, as you've been practicing a bit of uh, uh, entrepreneur, how in which way can someone? Where can I look, for example? Where can I look if I want to start a new business, do something different? Where, could, where should I start looking from? Where, 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 if, if, let's say, I had a compass, business compass, how, where, where should I direct myself to? Phenomenal question here. A good, thriving business is one that solves a big problem. If you identify a problem, you, you, right there you're able to get to the point of solving this. As soon as you identify a problem, and this is what, what, what we call in entrepreneurship, a hair on fire problem. 
a problem that people there it's like there there's a urgent need to solve this problem yet mm. no one has presented us a, a solution to this problem and if you enter the market and present a viable solution to this problem you have a strong business opportunity this is it this is the crux of it if on my row or my street there's already 70 restaurants adding one more restaurant that may not be a hair on fire problem but maybe there's a certain type of cuisine or a certain type of food that's not present for example by the way in america the most failed business unfortunately is restaurant business because there's so many i presume and there's so many and also it's people underestimate what it takes doing mm. well in the restaurant business is not just having a good recipe and being able to cook well it takes a lot more you have to manage your staff you have to be able to make sure you get supplies make sure you're managing everything and make sure everyone feels comfortable marketing sales so many things go into true. a successful restaurant it's, it's not just cooking well so in terms of that are you and i we need to think about what problem are we solving number one. is it a hair on fire problem is it a urgent problem that people are willing to pay out of their pockets for people who have the money are they willing to pay for this to solve this problem this is the way you should be thinking and i should be thinking in terms of business another suggestion that i would give to some of our brothers and sisters young and old alike is try to read the biographies of sex, su- successful business people throughout history or try to read the biographies of innovators and people who for example are inventors whether that's re- reading the biography of thomas edison who said that i for example i didn't find a thousand ways to i didn't find 999 ways to to i didn't find a thousand ways not to make it he says i found 999 ways not to make a light bulb i didn't fail a thousand times in making a light bulb i found a certain amount of ways not to make it or uh, someone who's behind the scenes did more work maybe nikola tesla ah tesla was the man you. who actually get, who did a lot of work for edison and maybe should get more credit than thank edison you. himself and so thank maybe you. read his biography thank you for saying that i don't want to mention a lot but people if they're interested with regards to thomas edison as mm-hmm. well um, recently i just did a bit random research about and i was shocked mm. we are uh, taught a lot of things at school were may not be necessarily true but i'll leave that to the audience uh, about uh, thomas edison and nikola tesla but with that being said mm. bismillah and that's very important to know read those biographies read the biographies of success wisdom but now everything has a very sm- a strong caveat only follow that which is with ethics do not lie cheat uh-huh. or steal at any uh-huh. moment that's in time that's the thing only with ethics don't forget don't forget your morals don't Absolutely. forget never forget your foundation those. just Be for the sake of very adamant that's the thing i know businessmen not very far from here who've done very well they had some of the big they had big clients who were from alcohol companies yeah. and they said no we will not accept this people were willing to pay a lot but wrapping up with respect to managing income unfortunately till this day people children are not taught financial education properly ahlul bayt alayhi salam manage your finances properly that is a part of deen inshallah ah santum and uh, with that being said uh, unfortunately once again said now we've run out of time and uh, would like to thank you all for being with us inshallah i hope this uh, uh, show has been as beneficial to you as it has been to us uh, would like to uh, ask you all kindly to remember us in your duas and the poor and the needy and the oppressed of this world and especially always uh, pay, uh, pray for the hastening of the reappearance of imam al asr was zaman ajallah ta'ala fajr sharif with that being said like to thank you all and our team for making this happen and uh, until next week Uh, my salams for me and uh, Sayyid and uh, enjoy your uh, iftar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.